What are we talking about today? Practical tips that you need to know about taxes in Spain and a couple of other general ones for the new ones of you here today. So, as you can see, that's apparently me. As you can see, I used to work in investment banking and uh, I used to be very well prepared. It would be better. I know, I've degraded. It's, 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 uh, it's fine. I'll, uh, I'll, I'm sure I'll regain something at some stage. Um, but yeah, I, I mentor a little bit on the Harvard Business X program for the MBA program there. Uh, I did a bit of writing, but none of that is relevant for your taxes. What is relevant for your taxes and what is relevant for you being in Spain? The following. So, who's heard of the Certificado Digital? Hands up. Who has Certificado Digital? Right. Who has Clave? Right, Certificado Digital is like Clave on steroids, right? This is the most useful thing you'll find in Spain. Spain has actually made incredible progress on certain aspects of digitalization. So while migration and NIAs and everything else is a nightmare, nightmare, this thing is pretty fantastic. You download and install this onto your machine, and this grants you access. This is what's called the Fabrico Nacional de Moneda de Timbre, so the, effectively the central bank, the currency issuance, bit weird why they issue the digital certificate, but that's it. Um, this certificate allows you to do almost all the procedures you need in Spain online. There are still some exceptions, transport, the uh, Hite is still not functioning on it. You've got a few other areas of migration which are not fully integrated, but this is your digital identity. With this, you or your accountant or your lawyer can basically make all the submissions you need. You can see the notifications from the government, and unfortunately, that means you don't have a very good excuse for not seeing any government notifications. Why? With this login, you can go and see any notifications you get. It, you can't say it's lost in the mail because it is here. So my biggest advice for everyone here today, please, please, please get the Certificado Digital. You can go straight onto the uh, website of the Sede Electronica, FNMT. Now, critical part here, you can hire someone like us to get it. It's not really worth the money. It's very easy, just log on. You can search online YouTube videos, we've got them, we'll guide you through it. In fact, you can even ask us and we'll probably send you the link. Hey, what's the link? Just go onto our website, entretramites.com. Uh, good luck at spelling it, it's like there. Um, but uh, this is the most useful starter point. So I please, please get it uh, because this will make your life a lot easier. Now, second tip, you guys pay more, okay? Foreigners pay more in Spain, particularly if you don't speak Spanish, okay? Um, we did a little bit of a survey of our different, um, or this was actually for last year's event, we did a big survey for this. So um, we basically realized that 68% um, premium is the average amount that non-Spanish speakers were paying. So one thing, uh, this will amaze you. So who is registered as autonomo? at the moment. Keep your hand up if your accountancy firm or anything charged you for the registration. It was us. So, we charge about 55 euros plus VAT approximately, or it's the monthly accounting subscription, 37 euros plus VAT, right? If you look at some of the quotes I've got from some of our clients, from non, particularly people from North America, they get absolutely rinsed. North America and Asia have had, have had some pretty awful experiences. We're talking 500 euros to register as an autonomous. 500 euros. So the big thing is you have a massive variation in pricing. People see an opportunity, they're like, you don't know where you are. So what are our first few tips? First off, use Google Translate and make your request in Spanish if you're requesting online. Ask for two or three quotes. Why? because then you get a good idea of what the price should be. You don't necessarily want to go for the cheapest, but if one is five times higher than the other one, you know something's wrong, okay? If you may ask for this, so really, really important, make sure you ask for any professional services quote, request it in Spanish, even if English is your first language, put the submission in in Spanish, put it through Google Translate, because I promise you, you'll get a better price. Now, uh, the other thing is you find, yeah, so that's Google Translate to request the prices for things. Uh, ask what it includes. One thing which is so common here is like they'll say, hey, our accounting for a limited company is only 70 euros a month. Yeah, but annual accounts is 600, corporation tax is 300, every response to a submission of information will charge you. Then we have the hourly contact rate if you want to talk to your accountant. And you go, wait, I thought I was paying for all that. 
So one thing you'll find is lots of like hidden fees. The market loves hidden fees, um, and particularly lots of smaller providers do that quite a lot because they, it allows them to have lots of price discrimination. That means they can charge the most as they can to each of their clients. Um, so always ask and watch out for the hidden parts. Oh, immigration is one of the classic ones where that you might get an initial fee, then a follow-up fee to get the tier, which is like 300 euros after, and suddenly you're like, hang on a second, I've just paid three, four times more than I thought I was gonna pay, okay? So be careful. Now, this is a quick one on the expat premium. Um, if you scan this, we can give you a whole set of the different tax tip guides that we're gonna have. I think it has one question and then your email and then it'll just submit to you a tax tip guide. So if everybody just takes a quick moment on that to shamelessly scan, and then we're gonna get into the core tax tips which I think will be relevant for most of the audience. Cool, okay. I'll give 30 seconds more, and then we're gonna get onto the interesting parts. Diez, nueve, ocho, siete, Seis, cinco, el nuevo año está. No, I'm sorry, it's not the new year. We don't have anything that exciting. So, now we go. Okay, tax tip, Beckham's Law. Who's heard of Beckham's Law? Hands up. That's a great one. Who's heard of Mbappe's Law? It's not legal yet, don't worry, and it's not very clear. That's something happening in Madrid, but it seems like it's going to be a lot less interesting than they initially promoted. So, we get onto Beckham's Law. Beckham's Law. First off, there's been a big change. Beckham's Law previously used to be for employees only. Now it is available for entrepreneurs as well. This means if you've got a business overseas, if you are moving here, you might be able to get access to Beckham's Law. If you've got an employment contract abroad and you get an A1 certificate or certificate of coverage to post you, let's say you're working in Germany and you get posted, you can also have access to Beckham's Law. Now, Beckham's Law is not just interesting because of the 24% flat rate of tax. That actually is only useful if your income is about 53, 54,000 euros or above. Why? You still need to pay social security. Income tax is not necessarily the highest tax that many of you pay. Oh, here's a question. Who here knows how much employer social security is in Spain? Okay, hands up at the beginning. Tell at what point, put your hands down at the point you think we've reached the rate of tax. So everybody hands up for a second. Spanish payroll tax is more than 5% on the employer. 10%, 15%, 20%, 25%, 30%, 35%. It's 32% on the employer. So when you get a pay slip as an employee here, your employer is paying 32% more. You are then paying 6.5% employee social security and then you pay the 24% flat rate of tax on your income. So that's the great hidden tax which you don't realize when you are an employee. So when you're negotiating with any form of employer, that's one thing to bear in mind if you're moving potentially here from an overseas contract. However, if after that negotiation your income's above 53,000 euros approximately, go for this. The other time Beckham's Law is super useful. If you have assets abroad, let's say you had a home overseas, which you've now rented out. On that home, you should pay taxes where that home is based. But if you're under Beckham's law, you do not need to pay taxes here. So your question there on your home back in France, if you're registered in Spain under Beckham's law, you do not need to pay tax on your overseas assets income. This is very useful if you have overseas investments. It protects you from wealth tax, income tax for up to the first six years. You're eligible, if you're an employee of a Spanish firm, digital nomad for the purpose of employment, this is one of the big mis-sellings that has gone around. If you are a digital nomad, por cuenta propia, which is self-employment, you cannot get Beckham's law. You cannot get the 24% rate. You have to register as an autonomo and you're non-eligible. The other option is if you are the director of a company, inclusive if you own more than 25% of it. If you take over a bar, a restaurant, as part of your move across here, you can get Beckham's law. This can be particularly useful if you may have built up assets, you may have had a previous career and had success, um, reasonable levels of success because it can actually lead you to have one of the lowest rates of tax on your overseas assets. You may pay almost nothing abroad and get to live in this beautiful country. Now, when is it useful? 53K of income, high potential bonus, 
or if you have significant overseas assets. If you want to scan there, you can ask in on Beckham's Law Consultation, see if it's for you. That's a free 30 minutes with one of my colleagues. Um, beyond that little link, yeah, I know, lots of QR codes. Um, Beyond this link here, we also do consultations on all sorts of other areas of tax, which we can share. And um, when you go out, uh, my colleague Santiago is going to be passing a whole range of different folletos, like little brochures, uh, which goes through with the ability to book in for 30 minutes. Okay? Or you can come across to our stand. Now, if you are qualified under any of those three criteria, Beckham's Law might be for you. Even if you have a low in lo relatively low income, if you have assets overseas, it can be worthwhile. If your partner gets Beckham's Law, and you are married if you're partnered, you can get Beckham's Law as well. So this can be particularly useful if one of you comes in as employed, and the other one, let's say, is self-employed. The only key caveat is your salary cannot be higher than them. So that's tip one. Now, the unfortunate thing is Beckham's Law is only eligible if, for those who've recently moved. Now, sometimes studies does not count as a full move, and you can potentially move initially on an educational visa and then move across. Um, but that's worth speaking to the consultant on that side because otherwise I'll bore you all to tears with too many details. Um, but key thing is you should apply within six months of arriving here under the criteria. With education, there's a little bit of an extension. Okay? Now, double tax relief, your question. So, um, if you don't have um, Beckham's Law, your global income is taxable. It does not matter that your assets are overseas. Most countries across the globe have this same rule. Now, for people from the States, this is a bit of a complication because as a US national, you always have to pay taxes in the States as well. However, because Spanish tax is higher than US federal taxes, in general, you pretty much need to worry just about the Spanish taxes. There's a few niche parts where that's not the case, but you basically include all your income and you figure out what your Spanish taxes would have been. Okay? Now... This does not mean that if you've paid tax in another country, you do not need to pay your Spanish taxes. Why? The system just means you pay the higher of the two systems when you combine them. It saves you the money that, imagine you were meant to pay 30% in Spain and 25% in the US. It means you pay 25% in the US and the 5% topped up in Spain, not that you pay 55%. It does not mean that, hey, I paid 25% in this other country, therefore I don't need to pay anything in Spain. Okay? It just avoids you being overly taxed. You, you never pay less than a Spaniard would have paid. Please. I have a question on the, I have a question on the other slide that you had. Um, money in an overseas bank account. Even if that is net, like it's already taxed in the home country, let's say? Yes, even if it's net. Um, the tax which you paid from gross interest to net interest on your bank account is taxable, but you get a credit for whatever you've paid. So if you paid 15% in, uh, let's say, Slovenia, um, I really do pick random countries in this. So 15% in Slovenia, and then you pay, you meant to pay 21% in Spain, you pay the 6% difference, okay? So uh, if the assets are overseas, yes, you do face taxation. Um, global income is tax too. So basically, wherever it's based, you pay the tax first, where it's ba the asset is based, and then you pay taxes here in Spain. Okay? Now, please, 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 please. This is something which I hear so often. Look, nobody's caught me. I've been doing it for three years. I'm fine. Guys, with tax, failure to declare in Spain is the equivalent is tax evasion, right? And one of the things which occurs with this is there is no statute of limitations. You hear some accountants say, hey, after four years or after seven years, you, they can't pursue you. That's a lie. If you fail to declare assets, they can sit, pursue you till you're 90. And increasingly, we're seeing coordination, particularly within the EU, on retrospective moves where they're looking to enforce it across the EU. So imagine where it can potentially block you out this tax liability from any other country where you might be in. Now, if you've only been here for one year, you slightly went over the 183 days and you were tax resident, probably no one's going to care. What happens though is once you are really established here, you really need to pay your tax on your overseas assets. On top of the taxes, there's a thing called Modelo 720, uh, which is actually for assets over more than 50k. Apologies for the typo there. Um, if you have assets over 50k overseas, you need to file the Modelo 720. Who's heard of the Modelo 720? Quickly. Hands up. Not many. If you own more than 50,000 euros of assets overseas, this is not a tax declaration, but it's an informative filing. Usually you don't need to file it more than once, but definitely once you've moved it, you have to file this if you own more than 50,000 euros of assets outside of Spain. Okay? 
houses, um, stocks and shares, cash in bank accounts. Very important, this is to be filed before March 31st next year. If you need any help, as you can guess, it's boring, so we can help. Um, wealth tax is often not covered by dual tax treaties. So el impuesto de patrimonio, which is the tax if you have assets in Catalonia of more than half a million euros, um, although it's not that big a tax if your assets are below one and a half million, above that it really can become quite significant. Um, the wealth tax is often not covered by dual tax treaties because many countries do not have wealth taxes, okay? So there's often no deductibility for equivalent taxes in other jurisdictions. The final one, and then I'm going to open to questions because I know I've been ranting quite a bit. Exemption 7P. Has anyone heard of Exemption 7P? This is a really cool one. If you're an employee and you go overseas on behalf of an employer, let's say you work in consulting, you're working for Accenture, you go and you get posted to Germany for like a month, you get posted to Ireland for 15 days. In Spain, you can have up to 60,000 euros of your income exempt from income tax if it is earned overseas and if you've paid the relevant income tax there. Why is this interesting, paid the relevant income tax there? In most countries, they have tax-free allowances. So if you're posted abroad for 15 days or 30 days, you do not need to pay income tax in that jurisdiction. So it, this can be very useful, and this can be particularly useful if, let's say, you get a two-month contract with an overseas company. Let's say you travel back to the States for a minute and make a little bit of earnings for two months. You do not need to declare that in Spain if it's employment earnings. Or to the UK, to Germany, to the Netherlands, to Morocco, doesn't matter. Wherever, if it's an employment contract, if it adds up to less than 60,000 euros a year, it is exempt from taxes. You do not need to declare it. You can even reclaim it if you had a Spanish employer and say, hey, my employer posted me abroad for this period. Okay? So very important when you get to your end of your tax return because that can be quite a nice reclaim. One thing, if you do a reclaim, they will always, always ask you for a letter afterwards to confirm it. Do not worry when the tax authorities say, hey, prove that you weren't here because your employer will have already declared your full income and you're then saying, hang on, 10,000 euros of this should not have been taxed. Ignore that because uh, that was meant to be dynamic and uh, isn't working. So this is uh, for a free consultation with lots of my team for anything on taxes, immigration, anything you don't want to do. But what I'd love to open up now for is quickly a few questions before I get jeered off stage. So please, questions, what do people have? I'll pass to you while we wait for the other microphone. Um, are there any taxes that we should keep in mind of uh, if there is an, um, if I'm lending money to friends or family within Europe or outside of Europe? So it's a amount that is my friend wants to buy a house and I want to just uh, borrow him some money which he wants to pay me over next six months or one year or so on. So should I uh, like keep into mind taxes on that as well because it would be a big amount transfer being shown into my bank account and his bank account both? So uh, it's quite important to record loans. There's a thing called, if you've got interpersonal loans, which are significant. Okay, this is the classic stupidity in Spain. If you go to um, a wedding, you often get asked to do a gift of 150 euros or something. Technically, that should be declared under the tax return and no one does it. So one of the weird things I've learned in Spain is gray zone in the UK was always something which isn't clear if it's legal or illegal. Whereas in Spain, there's lots of stuff which is technically illegal, but is not enforced. So every single wedding that everybody's go to should have been declared to the tax authorities. No one does it, right? Now, when you've got significant loans like yours, if it's a note enough to be a mortgage, you should declare, but it's not a gift. What it is is called the Modelo 600. Modelo 600 is effectively a declaration which says that, hey, I've made this loan, and then any interest you earn on it, you need to pay tax on, right? And usually if your loan is very cheap, they don't really care, but if you make the loan too expensive, um, there can be certain issues where they say, is this truly a fair loan? So, but if it's to somebody who you don't have blood relations or anything, make sure you record that loan because gifts and inheritances are taxed in Spain. Even if your assets are overseas or you inherit it from overseas, they are taxable. So very important on a loan, fill out this form. Um, if it's moved back and forth within a few months, it won't matter, but if it's like a year, two years, I would definitely do it. Uh, Modelo 600. There's a couple of variants to it um, on that. Do we have the other microphone or not? Yes. Perfect. If you can go there and we'll get the guy there and then next one just down here would be fantastic. Thank you. 
Uh, hi, uh, I just wanted to ask um, if you have some investments abroad, like you said, uh, but uh, and let's say they appreciate in value, but you don't cash them out. So do you need to pay tax on the appreciated bid or not? No. So very good question. Unrealized gains are not taxable. Until you sell an asset, they're not taxable. The only tax would be as if your assets end up being worth more than the wealth tax, then the wealth tax could apply. But unrealized gains are not taxable. Other thing very important. If you have an ISA, if you have a Roth IRA, any of these tax-free savings accounts in other countries, they are not tax-free in Spain, even though they're tax-shielded. Only pension funds are tax-shielded on their income and growth. So if you've got a 401k, an IRA, if you've got, I'm trying to remember all the different variants, uh, SIP in the UK, etc., etc., and those can be tax-free. Uh, the microphone, el microfono, ah, perfecto. Perfect, please, fire away. Uh, yeah, so a follow-up question on the question asked by the lady. Uh, for example, I'm a student, and uh, if I lent an amount, let's say 4,000, 5,000 euros to a friend of mine, and then he gives it back after like three or four months, do I have to be That's concerned about tax, or is it, what is this like? So technically, you have to file the model of 600, whatever you lend. In reality, with that sort of sum of money, I wouldn't necessarily worry about it because the infringement tax would not be worth it. It's insignificant. Um, it's just, if they ask, you say, hey, it was for this, and they're like, oh, you should have filed this. Um, but that's, yeah, so I wouldn't worry too much. I'll pass okay. to you in front. Sorry, I have, a, I have a general question. Uh, you just blew up my mind, and if to take... Uh, 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 okay, okay. It's just, just the general question. You just blew up my mind, and uh, if we take all, like, the law, the t tax law in Spain, and you have a company here, or you make lots of money here, whatever, if we take the all law in general, do we have a chance to balance and to make money here? Or we <laughs> oh no, there is no way. Okay, this is a very interesting one. Um, so uh, the reality is yes. And one of the good news is which is happening in Spain is how quickly it's cleaning up. So Spain has made incredible progress on cracking down on corruption, cracking down on the black market, and the tax authorities are very sharp. Um, I will give them massive credit on this side. Why? High taxes are a problem for you having success as a business only when your competition is cheating and not paying. Why? Because they increase the cost for your competition as well. So one of the interesting things on this is that as Spanish enforcement has been improving, actually the environment for those who play by the rules is improving every day. Um, some of the most successful businesses are actually in the Nordics. The Nordics have one of the highest tax burdens in all of the world. But one of the big, and there's lots of people, actually the Nordics have a load of billionaires. Not just because their currency is low, I'm meaning dollar billionaires, euro billionaires. <laughs> um, but basically, if you look on enforcement, there are also certain tax breaks when you begin, and, but you've got, to, you've got to, and there's a second thing which works to your advantage. Because the marginal tax rate is quite high in Spain, um, it does mean that a lot of your competition may not work quite as hard as you'd be expecting in other jurisdictions. So you can get ahead of your competition more easily here. I don't think we could have grown as quickly if I was in the US, if I was in um, more aggressive do do dominant markets than here, because here my competition doesn't move as quickly. So you've got to think there's a bit of trade-offs in all this. And I think Spain is also going through a massive um, transformation with the movement from Latin America, the part of it being a key destination. I mean, Barcelona particularly, if you look as a city, is somewhere where you have a trilingual labor market. You have a Catalan labor market, a Spanish labor market, an English labor market in one place. You've got a, an attraction for labor which makes things very easy and people are willing to take salaries way lower here because they get to move here and live here. So that gives you an advantage when you're looking even to compete overseas. So even though your tax burden might be higher, if you're paying for a good software engineer 40%, 50% less than they are in Germany, and you've got flight connections which are way easier, actually, even on international competition, there are certain very attractive things. Now, I could go on forever on it, because I'm an economist by training and I love public economics and all that on plenty of issues and problems, but don't be disheartened. Just because your tax burden is going to be a bit higher than what you're used to, be aware that there are plenty of opportunities which come with that. Because your competition have to price higher and lots of employees are willing to take a lower salary to be here. Okay? Oh, all, all right. Um, 
firstly thank you for this uh, informative session i have a quick question uh, no, no, basically i'm here on a dependent visa it's been around 10 months now uh, but i have joined a job for last three months i mean in in the month of june i have joined a job so will i be eligible for beckham's law but my uh, wife who is the primary uh, visa uh, uh, candidate she doesn't have a beckham's law here Hang on a second, but you said you arrived on an entrepreneurship visa. How are you? No, I am on a HQP visa. Dependent? HQP dependent visa. HQ dependent. Sorry, I misheard. Um, so it depends on when you started and when your considered last entry into the country was. Oh. So even though you've been here 10 months, wh which month are we in? I am here uh, in December last year. I joined a job in June this year. So if you'd applied in June you could have definitely got Beckham. We're now in the area where there's a bit of a question, but depending on when you've left and re-entered the country, it might be possible. Because the rule is to do with six months after the social security date, registration date, but they could treat it as too early an entry, but you can count your later entries. So that's a bit, what I would do, come to our table afterwards, just to go in a little bit of detail on that, okay? Um, in, principle, in principle, yes. Actually, the best thing, did you scan the Beckham's law consultation? Um, if you've entered and gone in and out, it's entirely possible that we can make the application, but yours is not necessarily guaranteed in the same way, right? Because of the timeline. Um, but there's a bit of wiggle room, basically, to do with that, to do with when you registered an employment contract and afterwards. Um, the, okay, I'm being told that I've broken all the rules. So, please, guys, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for bearing with me. And, um, yeah. So please, um, if you've got any questions, Elam over there, hand up. Uh, Elam uh, and Santiago, who's the other one on the t-shirt, will just be outside uh, for any questions you have, and I'm going to hang around for a little bit as well. Been a pleasure. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure.